Alright, so in this theme, we are going to look at the concept of thermodynamics and look at the basic principles of energy and how that relates to chemical reactions. And of course, these things uh, do have an important impact in, on our everyday life. I mean, uh, a car or any industrial process or even your refrigerator makes use of these concepts to keep on running and in some way or form, we'll be able to describe why certain things happen by the end of this theme and why they happen in a certain direction. Well, actually not a direction, but at least how heat flows between different systems or system and surroundings. So to start off the conversation, we need to define a few basic things regarding the language of thermodynamics. So what we define something as energy is the capacity for something to do work. So once something has energy, it should be able to do some form of work. And this energy is categorized normally into kinetic and potential energy. And you should be aware that the kinetic energy in a molecular system, meaning that any kind of movement, so kinetic means movement, of the molecules, the vibration of atoms in molecules, that is the kinetic energy. And that then relates to thermal energy because how much something moves or how vigorously molecules move within um, solution or in the solid state, their vibration in solid state, that then depends or indicates a kind of how much energy they have in terms of uh, what kind of thermal energy that they have. Now, the next point is, uh, we all know what the law of conservation of energy is. So, meaning the energy can be converted in a system, so, or in one, there's no way that we can create energy. We can only convert it between different states. So, energy is um, constant in the universe. So, for example, you can take kinetic energy, do a reaction or give a reaction kinetic energy and translate that into potential energy by forming molecular bonds. So, in other words, potential energy is the energy stored within molecular bonds in, or in that specific case. Or alternatively, you can also um, give something potential energy and then you can get kinetic energy from that. Um, or you break the potential energy. So in other words, something that is a very vigorous reaction will break open bonds and that releases a lot of energy. So then, of course, that gives kinetic energy in another sense. But those two are, will have to be related. Whatever is given off needs to be absorbed by something or whatever is absorbed by something needs to be given by something else. So to define easier to use terms, we're going to look at some two things. One called the system. Oops. Uh, one called the system, another thing called surroundings. And that's essentially to define everything that we want to look at. And we'll look at how we define these things in the way that we want, so that we get a, a nice idea of how energy, or uh, we'll look at heat flows in a, or in a system, but uh, how it works in thermodynamic systems. Right, so we look first at what a system is. So a system is defined as anything that we want to look at. So for example, a system could be a chemical reaction, or it could even be just an atom. So if you have your reaction flask, and you have, for example, A plus B giving C, then our system we define as the reaction, and A, B, and C are the things that are in our system. And all the other things, so the water, the flask, the, the air around the flask, we then define that as the surroundings. So there's this interplay between a system. So whatever we want to put in our box, we call that our system. And everything then outside of that, we call the surroundings. So you'll see I make use of these abbreviations. So I call it SAIS and SUR. So system and surroundings. And in this different cases, different things will happen. But what we are interested in thermodynamics is the exchange of 
energy between these two things. So we are interested to know when can they exchange energy and when does which one give the other one energy and when does which one take energy from the other one, right? So it's all about perspective. So immediately, I mean, you should start thinking if the system gains energy from the surroundings, from the surroundings point of view, it is giving the system energy. And because of the law of conservation, of course, those two values need to be equal in um, magnitude, not necessarily in sign, but we'll discuss that just now. So you can have that basic idea um, in your head. Furthermore, the important thing is you can define these things whatever you would like, so you do it as needed. So whatever you need to describe the situation, you define these two um, as such. The only requirement is that they are that they have to be in contact and able to exchange energy in some um, way or form. Whatever, the, that doesn't matter. However it does it, it just needs to be in contact and exchange energy. So there's no, for example, barrier here that inhibits the surroundings and the system from exchanging energy. Right. So we'll first look at the concept of thermal equilibrium. Now, thermal equilibrium links to the idea of something called an isolated system. And, I mean, it, the words immediately imply it. A system is isolated. It's isolated from what? It's isolated from its surroundings. So if you isolate a system from its surroundings, are they still in contact? No. And hence, then, there should not be any energy exchanged um, from that, from or between the system and the surroundings. So the only way, place where energy really can flow is within the system itself. So that's the idea of an isolated system. We'll look at different kinds of systems um, from now on, but we started the idea of an isolated system. So you can call it isolated is only the system, whatever you want to call it. Now, we want to look at the concept of thermal equilibrium. So thermal equilibrium, we can imagine an example as follows. So let's say you have two blocks of copper or any metal, really, anything with a temperature. One is at a high temperature, the other one is at a lower temperature. Right, same mass, same size, same everything. Doesn't necessarily have to be the same mass and same size in an isolated system, but we'll discuss that just now. And we define the boundary lines. In other words, we define both of these together, we define as our system. So this is our system. And we tell you, or we're told now, okay, look, the system is isolated from its surroundings. What will happen? What is the only thing that really can happen? Well, it would make sense that because these two blocks are within the system, and the energy cannot go outside of the system, these two blocks will only exchange energy with each other, right? So the 500 Kelvin one should cool down to some value and the 100 Kelvin one will take up that energy and heat up. But this is within the system because both blocks are the system. So they both should end up eventually at um, the average temperature. So that's 300 Kelvin, um, 300 Kelvin. And our system is still just that. It's no energy being exchanged with the surroundings. It's within the system. So if you want to draw like a little idea here for yourself, this one gives energy. It gives heat. So heat is the thing that's being transferred in this case. And I mean, that sort of makes inherently sense because what is temperature? You would say, well, it's, something is hot. So, I mean, it's, it's heated. All right. And the important point is this is only valid in an isolated system. So, isolated system. You can ask yourself, right, if we didn't isolate the system from the surroundings, what would then happen? 
what would then also come into play? And I mean, the answer is the surroundings will also have a temperature. So then you also need to consider that. But we don't have to consider that because we isolated our system from the surroundings. In other words, the only thing, two things that can exchange any form of energy is the two blocks. You also should note that there aren't really any examples of isolated systems. It's a theoretical construct. It's a way, it's a place where we start. So, yeah. So this wording that I give here, it says there's energy is exchanged as heat until both are the same temperature and then thermal equilibrium is achieved. So thermal equilibrium is when both are at the same temperature. So they've equilibrated from 500 and 100 Kelvin to 300 and 300 Kelvin. All right. So that is the idea. So as I've said now a couple of times, if we close off this system from its surroundings, in other words, make it an isolated system, so and then the blocks in it, it's called an isolated system, right? So that's the definition. So that's part one of this. So you can break it up for yourself there. Now, what can happen? What What's the next step? So we've isolated a system from the surroundings. Now we can, in the next step, we allow the system to exchange energy with the surroundings. So when energy can only be transferred as heat between a system and its surroundings, we define it as a closed system. This wording might be a bit ambiguous, so it actually means when only energy can be transferred between the system and surroundings, it is called a closed system. But what does only energy mean? Energy and matter, so the law of mass conservation, the law of energy conservation. In this case, no matter is able to be transferred between a system and the surroundings. Only energy and heat, essentially. Only heat um, can be transferred, uh, or let's keep it as energy, between a system and its surroundings. So in other words, there must be some directionality. So what is the difference between... So let's have a little block here, a system, and the surroundings is all this stuff outside here. So what is the difference between when the system gives heat to the surroundings versus when the surroundings gives energy to the system? How do we differentiate between that? And that is where the concepts of exothermic and endothermic comes in, especially, especially because we are looking at uh, chemical reactions. So we define something that is exothermic as the system. So remember, we say the system is the chemical reaction, and the surroundings is the beaker, the water, the, all the stuff that it's happening in. And when it's exothermic, the energy goes as heat from the system to the surroundings. So the orange one is this one, when the system gives energy to the surroundings. And that means if the system gives energy to the surroundings, what must happen to the energy of the system? The energy of the system must decrease. And what must happen to the energy of the surroundings? The energy of the surroundings, it's gaining energy, so it must increase. Okay, so... That's the basic concept that you have. And of course, if you do the opposite, then it's called an endothermic process. Endothermic just expresses it as where the system gains energy from the surroundings. So the surroundings now gives energy to the system. So it's the blue arrow that I had here. Um, and of course, then all the arguments change. So the system gains energy its energy increases, the surroundings loses energy, so in other words, its energy, total energy decreases. Then we define a quantity, so the heat, or the, uh, the, yeah, the heat transferred between these, these two things, we give it a symbol of Q. So Q is a symbol for heat, and then because the system has a value of uh, losing energy in the exothermic case, the Q of the system needs to be less than zero. We, of course, the SYS means system. So the heat of the system refers to, so Q of system means what is the value that it loses, and that, that must be a negative value, right? So it might be um, minus 100 kilojoules. That is what it's giving away. 
So you look at it from the system's perspective. Alternatively, you can, of course, say the Q of the surroundings. What will that then be? Well, it needs to be the opposite in sign. So the, the Q of the surroundings increases, so it must be positive. And, of course, then, once you go to endothermic, the argument swaps. So, in this case, the system is gaining energy, so it must be positive. And then the heat of the surroundings must decrease. So, that then is negative. Right, so the polar, these are opposites of each other, and that's how they linked. And of course, it's important because this is valid only in a closed system. Closed system means matter cannot be um, displaced between the two. However, energy may be exchanged. Isolated means no matter, no energy can be exchanged. Closed means energy exchange and then there's one system that we won't really look at it's an open system so an open system matter and energy can exchange between our system and the surroundings okay so here in this figure is given a uh, like a visual interpretation of exothermic and endothermic so what it says here is so we have our system our system in the exothermic case we said it gives energy to the surroundings and that means that the heat of the system is less than zero. Why? Because our system loses energy. So, loses energy. That's why it's negative. Opposite case, when the surroundings gives the system energy, we call it endothermic. And this case... It's positive, the heat is positive because the system gains energy. Okay, so those are the basic concepts of thermodynamics. We have different kind of systems. So we have isolated, closed and open systems. And in the closed system, only energy can be exchanged within the system. So the things within the system, they play on their own. Once you have a, a closed system, so I, I meant isolated system for the first one, closed system, then the surroundings and the system can exchange energy, so as heat. So that is allowable. Um, and then finally, in an open system, then even matter can be exchanged. But we won't really look at that too much. All right, so I think that is a nice introduction to the basic ideas of, of thermochemistry, um, thermodynamics in general. And we will look in the next video, we'll look at the concept of now, I mean, it's nice to say that this thing has so much heat that it can provide, but how much heat is actually absorbed? Um, and how does it change the temperature of a specific substance? And that's what we'll look at next.